Hi, my name is Nathan, and today we're going to do a comic book review of Something is Killing the Children, issues number one through five, which is also a comic book set, The Slaughter Pack, link in description, by the way, brought to you by Rated Comics. If this is your first time here, like the video, subscribe to this channel. It'll help Rated Comics to make more comic book related content and comic book reviews like this. Timestamps in description and also link in description if you wish to purchase the Slaughter Pack. Support the art, support the industry. With that being said, let's get to it. In this book, we start off with these group of kids playing Truth or Dare and James answers Truth. And he tells the kids about a noise that he heard out in the ravine with a big moan. And when he turned the lights on, he saw that there was this thing that was just standing there as big as a, as a tree, hissing and growling. And the kids are like, bullshit, we don't believe you. And this, right away, this book start, is beginning to remind me of like the Goonies mixed with it, R-rated version. This book is sick. So James ends with, okay, if you guys don't believe me, then truth. Meanwhile, we fast forward to James in the police interrogation room. Uh, telling the, the officer, the detective that, like I told you, I didn't see anything. It was just a sleepover. But the thing is, this kid has blood on his shirt and it's almost like he's in denial. And the detective was like, okay, then we just need to understand what happened. And James like, look, man, it wasn't real. I swear. I just heard them screaming. Two weeks later, we see this girl in a wagon with this blonde, with this sick mask, with, you know, wielding two blood drenched machetes. And she, and this blonde just chugs this water like crazy. And, and notice how this girl just has abnormally large eyes. Meanwhile, she gets a phone call and the girl asked her, "Are there? is it done? Are there more of them? And she tells his phone call, hey, I need about 16 hours in the shower and I'll be there. Girl, The blonde girl with the large eyes, the eyes just kind of stick out to me because they're abnormally large. She said, you know what? Let me get that shower because I stink. At school, Jace is confronted by these group of boys who are mourning in an aggressive way over those uh over their friend's death about that truth or dare night and james just had enough of it tells him to yeah <laughs> that in the principal's office i kind of like this principal he's like you know what should we do and he's like i guess you're supposed to call call my dad and the principal's like mm, i really you should have punched him in the face or something like that i'm not advocating violence but that kid was a pain and this just kind of turns James like, oh, what kind of principal are you? And he's like, look, it, look, it's kind of hard to deal with nine dead kids in two weeks and more missing every day. Nobody knows the thing, the cameras, it's all the spotlights on off in the sheriff's when we return my calls. No one knows where to start with this whole thing. James leaves the office. Meanwhile, we see Erica staring at this octopus doll and she looks at this poster full of missing kids. And the sheriff asked him, do you know one of them? And she's like, you could say that. So James is receiving a message on the phone with his dad telling him, well, it's not that important, just get the book. He looks into the darkness of the woods and then this girl, we've later found out her name is Erica Slaughter with the, the eyes just get to me, those eyes are large. And she goes up to him and is like, you're James, right? And James is like, I'm not sure. I mean, yeah, are you going to hurt me? He's like. And she just said, you mind if I ask you a few questions? Are you from the police? And she's like, boy, do I look like I'm from the police? So she's like, look, I don't want to know what you told the cops. I want to know what you saw. I know you're scared, but no matter how ridiculous it is, I promise you, I swear on my heart, hope to die. I'm going to believe you. So Erica is very familiar with the situation. So James explains this flashback when he see in the dark when he's in the woods and he sees carl crawling he's like man i can't scream my legs and we see his intestines just dragging from behind okay this book is insane man and james is like dude this ain't real got somebody help this can't be real and then he sees his other friend with carl with a chunk bitten out of him and his face just gnarled up and bleeding and blood he's like man, I, this cannot be real no 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 and then we see this monster ripping Carl in half. I don't know if it sounds like the Hulk when he's ripping him in half, but he's ripping him in half. And Erica Slaughter's like, thank you. And she gets another phone call and she tells that phone call, this is an E7 and, and you know, this is classified as E7. I got it handled. And James like, well, what do you mean you got it handled? And Erica tells you, you got a monster in those woods and I'm here to say, I'm going to help, I'm going to kill it. And James is like, well, can I help? And that's where we end off with the end of the book.
Now before I get into this review, if you like the content so far, or this is your first time here, consider liking the video and subscribing to Rated Comics YouTube channel. It'll help Rated Comics to make more content like this. We start off with 10 in the morning. This boy named Tommy, his alarm's going off and he puts his alarm or turns it off or puts it on sleep or whatever. And he says those two words that I think we all can relate to when we wake up in the morning before we're quite ready to. He goes downstairs, his mother is smoking and her ashtray is filled with cigarettes. She asked her son, tell me, did you sleep well? I'm, I'm, I'm running late, but did you sleep a little? Enough, she says, but you look terrible. Thanks, mom. Clearly, she's grieving of some sort. And it turns out what, she, what she's grieving about is the death of, their, of her daughter, Tommy's sister, Sophie. So Tommy is going through emotions. She's going through emotions. And no one's in this town is telling them what's going on or what happened to their daughter, Sophie. Is she dead? Is she not dead? They're not giving her any answers and she feels that they're not acting fast enough. So with that being said, Tommy's mom asked Tommy to take the stack of papers, those flyers, and put them on people's cars. Mom, I can't do that. What are they going to do? Fire you if you do it again? There's clearly he's done it before. No, I mean, mom, I'm the manager and the owner's really sympathetic. That put them on the cars. It'll make me feel better. Now go to work. Get all this out your head and don't forget about your sister Sophie. Oh, I won't. And also don't forget to put these stacks of papers on the cars too at your work. Oh, mom, I won't. But you know, grieving and emotions and things are not processed and you figure you're not getting your answers fast enough. I mean, what else is what else is supposed to do when you lose a loved one? Now here's what's interesting about this. When he goes to his car to go on his way to work, the Oscar type monster is there and he hears it, but he can't see it. Hello, is anybody there? Clearly you can tell that the monster does not show in the reflection of his car mirror, which is an awesome way. I love how this book shows you rather than tells you Erica and James go to Apple Beans. Not Apple Bees, Apple Beans, you know, copyright issues. So James like, so we're gonna start monster hunting by going to Apple Beans? Yes, we gotta figure out where to start. We're gonna start here. So Erica goes to Tommy, you the manager? Yeah, we. I mean, we just opened. The people, she's asking questions about the place. Do people come here a lot? Does it get pretty busy? And he's like, well, you know, I don't understand the question. So Erica tells him, look, I want that booth. I'm gonna leave my stuff there. Is that a problem? I need some secrecy, some privacy here to work. And to sweeten your deal, I will give you 50 bucks a day cash to store my backpack and my other stuff, make sure no one touches it. And when I come here every day, I'll order food and tip, it's all good. What are your thoughts on that? Well, okay, well there's another manager here on Thursday, she's a stickler. I'll steer clear of Thursdays then. So any day you're here, I'll pay 50 bucks on Thursdays, I'll get out the way. So it, on the surface, Tommy's like, okay, this is a cool deal. James like, whoa, girl, that's a lot of money. Hey, you know what, James? That is not the kind of thing you said out loud. Well, you pulled that out your back. Yeah, don't talk about it. You know, I like being mysterious. So you are the mysterious type. Yes, I am. And she busts out this octopus, which we later know in later issues, his name is Octo. But at that point, we don't know what this octopus is all about. James asks, you know what? Don't ask so many questions, boy. Why now? What can I ask? Uh, I don't know. You can't ask a lot. Nothing. So Erica busts out the paper that she printed out at Kinko's with all the dead people. And Erica asks him about Carl. Corner James, he's the one that keeps seeing that he keeps seeing in his dreams. It was like they're friends, but more the friends, but now they're no but now he's dead. So Erica's like, whoa, James, like you really liked him like more than friends, huh? He didn't know that. He didn't think so, but that's okay. So they're going through the big table and mapping out what's going on here. So this other girl comes up, says, welcome to Apple Beans. Can I take your order? Yes, I'll have a lager, says Erica, and a coffee. Kid says he wants a lager. No, he'll take a soda. I want a coffee too. Then I want to be part of the big boy. I'm a big boy. Well, he didn't say it like that, but that's pretty much the tone we're going for here. Let's do this. And James looks at Erica like, have you done this kind of thing before? You're acting like you've done this kind of thing before. And I love this flashback panel monologue of Erica showing that she's been slaying these monsters like it ain't nothing but cake and taking cake from a third or grader or candy or whatever you want to call them in the mood for cake and clearly she's like yeah i've done this kind of thing before so show me where your house is on this map they get to work this girl tells tommy you know that's kind of weird you know who that lady is i don't know who she is and this girl tells tommy you know this this girl is with that guy james he's one of the boys who survived the attack but he didn't say nothing to the police and is that his sister no way too old never seen him before that's freaking weird well he was a suspect and you know he's supposed to be in school right and if he's around that you got to do something so tommy's like you know whatever okay i'll do something about it so pretty much erica goes over the map okay we got three houses over here in the ravine behind your family's property two more that were found in the woods cabins campgrounds more on the boathouse nine dead so we're starting the patterns here 
Where does Sophie Mahoney live? And that's Tommy's sister. Sophie Mahoney live right there, right there on this map. Are you guys related? I'm her brother. And they're like, okay, all right, you know, back up, back up. It's all good. And Tommy's like, what are you two doing here? Before James can even speak, Erica's like, dude, shut up, James. Like, I got this. Do you know something? Do you know what happened to her? Where she might be? Look. James, like you're going through a lot of emotions right now. She's one of the missing bodies. I don't know where your sister is, Tommy. Well, how the F you know my name? Boy, your name tag, relax. So Erica knows the tension's about to get thick. She has to leave. She tells James to leave, grab my stuff, and go. Let's go, James, just leave. He fumbles her backpack and her machete knife came, came out. And Tommy's like, you did something to her, did you? Tommy's about to touch Erica Slaughter's shoulders. And in defense, she just reflexes on him. Puts him in a submissive position like, hey, I ain't trying to hurt you. You don't know any freaking thing, do you, Eric? Look, I'm going to go. I'm letting you go. I'm not going to hurt you, James. I'm just going to walk out that door. You're not going to see me again. Keep the money. I don't want no freaking trouble. When they leave, James get called out for being some kind of Satan cult. And Tommy calls the sheriff to report something suspicious. Erica and James leave and they're walking to their next step. Erica gets a phone call and you can tell she dreads that phone call. She answers a call. Yeah, I know the drill. It doesn't happen every time. I'm hanging up now. Who do you keep talking to? I don't know. James an asshole. So obviously in further issues like in House of Slaughter, which you can check out those reviews on this channel too, we get to know what's behind the secret society of the monster killing society. But in this issue, we're just gonna, we just don't know that. At least at that point when this issue was written. But I love the mystery we're gonna show you, but not tell you in this, in this issue. So back in Erica Slaughter's motel, she goes in and the hotel front desk is like, hey, you had a call. Yeah, I know. Too bad they missed me. Hey, dude, I don't want any trouble, all right? Well, me neither, says Erica. So when she gets in her hotel room and lays out her backpack and takes out her octopus, it's shocking that the octopus can talk, you know? And Erica tells the octopus, you saw the map. It's class E7. So they class these monsters down. There are still kids missing, so it's stashing us food somewhere. They are probably caves off the lake. I need to know what kind of thing it's going to be before I go looking for it. And it's probably going to be a few days before I can do that. So I need you thinking on it. In the meanwhile, do you understand? Octo says yes. Sheriff comes in. He get approached the front desk manager. I want her out of here. There's been noises. She creeps me the freak out. All right. All right. Go back to your office then, Ben. So when Sheriff Mahoney approaches Erica Slaughter's hotel room, we see this shadow and this light emitting from underneath the store step. What in the Sam Hill? So he rubs his eyes, looks at it again, that shadow disappears. Open up, police. I don't know what you got in the man, but I don't want any funny business. I don't know if he talks to other. It just sounds some, something that would fit, fit the bill. Erica opens the door. Nothing funny going on in here, officer. Now what seems to be the problem? And that is how we end Something is Killing the Children, issue number two. I thought, obviously, I already know what happens further on. I just want to upload some Something to Kill the Children content before it airs on Netflix. Let's be honest, I think it's a fantastic comic book. Link in description if you wish to add the Slaughter Pack set to your comic book collection, which is the first story arc that we have here, Rated Comics, which is issues number one through five. So you get the first story arc, get the gist of it, add this to your comic book collection, because when this airs on Netflix, this is going to be awesome to have into your collection. Not to mention, it's an awesome read. Netflix thought so, and I believe you will too. We begin this issue with the little girl in the closet in the dark saying to herself three times I don't believe in monsters because there is a monster in her house doing some killing and she is terrified to death. I don't believe and this monster is sniffing and creaking around and she runs out the way and look at there's a Ouija board on the ground that what are these kids doing these days and this monster is going to work killing what we can imagine being her parents or siblings arms under the bed desperate to get away she runs the monster sniffs, screams, and she's like, no! And she runs, and she runs so fast down the stairs that she breaks her wrist, dislocates her wrist, and the monster is crawling an inch and closer to her, knowing that that's, be my, that's about to be my next meal. Help! Please! Somebody help! Monster screams, oh no, please! Please! As she screams off panel as she meets her inevitable demise. Meanwhile, at the bar, we see this brother Tommy from the previous issue talking to his friends at the bar that this girl Erica, her eyes are too big like she knew something like where my sister was right now. And this girl's like, yeah, from the Applebee's restaurant or the Apple Beams to avoid copyright. Yeah, she was with this kid named James, right? The one that got away. So they asked James, where is she now? I don't know. I called the sheriff's office and they said they picked her up. Well, you trust them? No, F no. Well, what are you going to do if they let her go? 
what I have to do. So it foreshadows what, what's going to happen or what may happen a further issue down the line. So in the interrogation room, the sheriff is interrogating Erica Slaughter and like, this can't be your real name. Yeah, Erica Slaughter is my real name. That's a real name. It says so on the card. This is made of paper. Well, so is a social security card. And this ain't a social security card, Erica. It looks like a license. You made it at Kinko's and you'll be even laminated. Well, yeah, yeah. She's obviously distracted and she's looking at his wall to see what discovery, what findings, and how the detective case is going with this. Something is killing the children. And Sheriff Tate's like, look, man, I find you in an empty motel room talking to a stuffed animal. Now you're feeding me this bullshit. I'm not in the mood to be messed with right now. Erica's like, look, you asked me where I was on a bunch of dates. I told you, if you look at those dates and places, you're going to find a lot of stories about little towns like this with kids going missing. But that's going to freak you out and you're going to want to lock me up and throw away the key. But it doesn't change the fact that you saw me getting off the bus and she's referencing an issue number one. You know I wasn't there when these things were bad, but you still want to lock me up because it'll make you feel like you're doing something. That sum it up. He's like, yeah, sure. She's quickly turning the tables on him and she goes up to the billboard with the kids in the string going missing. Who went missing first? And the sheriff's like, wait a minute, I'm the detective here. What do you mean? Well, look, there were probably a few cases of disappearances you wrote off before there were bodies, before you knew there was something killing the children. I love the callback to the title in the dialogue in the caption here. Kids are missing that aren't on the list because you don't want them to be, because you don't want to be called out for it. Or I'll be nice because you hope you're right the first time. And it was just like some normal mundane ways of kids going missing, like an angry relative or running away or something like that. But deep down, you know they aren't missing. They're dead. The sheriff is like, dude, are you, it sounds like you're interrogating me. Yeah, sure. But see, you're the one we locked. We got locked up here. Yeah, okay, whatever. Who went missing first? The sheriff was like, dude, you're messing. Like, this is a game. This ain't a game. This ain't Milwaukee or Madison or even Green Bay. This isn't a place where this kind of stuff happens. Children are dead, Erica. She knows that. And she's like, of course I know that. That's why I'm here. Now, check this out. And this stuff with the eyes that Tommy was talking about, like, you're going to get a call soon. After that call, you're going to let me go. A little bit after that, this problem is going to go away. You're never going to really know what happened or why this has happened. To and this is going to drive you a little bit crazy. So in other words, Eric is asking, look, tell me who disappeared so I could get back to my job and do what I got to do. But you're never really going to know what's happening here. And it's going to drive you a little bit crazy. So another tech comes in and says, Joe, we got a problem. Is this your phone call, Erica? Nah, I don't think so. What is this about, dude? Well, it's about the Richards. There's five more of them missing. Five more children are dead. When? Just now, the call said that there was still blood splurting so it's fresh. And this is talking about what happened in the beginning of this issue. Put her in the drink tank. What, am I being charged or something? Yeah, for being drunk. Ah, you know, like whatever, dude. And so now Sheriff is pissed, like five kids are missing. What the freak do you know? I know how scared you are. I know what it feels like to feel responsible for each and every one you think you could have stopped. Can you stop this, Erica? Oh yeah, I can stop them. Why? Why can you stop this? I'm sorry, officer, but there isn't an answer I can give you that will make you feel any better. I'm not trying to be difficult. You just have to let me get out of here and let me do my thing. And the sheriff takes like, wait, there was a girl, Sarah Washington. They thought her uncle must have picked her up, but there wasn't any sign. This was a month and a half ago. So he finally tells who the first girl was. What do I do when I get that phone call? The one telling me to let you go. Tell them he's an asshole. They should have called sooner because five more kids are dead because of him. That's funny. But you know what? It's just tripping him out. He just wonders what, what the heck am I doing here? Sheriff, we need to get to the house to the coroner's on his way. And Sheriff was like, okay, I'm going to take care of her. First, I need you to keep an eye on her. Nothing too obvious. I just want to know what the hell she's up to. I got a bad feeling. I can't shake that this is all going to get much worse before it gets better. So Erica leaves. James is out there waiting for her. And Erica's like, dude, James, shouldn't you be at school? Well, yeah, I should, but I've been out here waiting for you. So they walk off together thinking of a plan to do. And Erica talks to Octo, her octopus, and tells them, do something. Doing something doesn't always make you feel better. James, five more children are dead. Kill inside the house. You know an E7 wouldn't be able to do that. What the hell am I up against? Or the octopus is like, the kill pattern is now more consistent with a class B Oscar type than a class E. And Jane's like, well, are you talking to the octopus? Yeah, we'll finish this up with her octopus. And she's pissed because she's not getting the answers and what the hell's going on here. And Jane's like, well, maybe you should try talking to human people and not a stop octo. Shut up, James. And Jane's like, whoa, and Erica's pissed because this is getting to her head. But now we end this issue with James being, I'm sorry. And Erica's like, no. I'm sorry, you lost your friend and you're scared out of your mind and that's okay And it's not fair of me to put you in any of this But there are more kids down and it's getting stronger and less afraid of making a mess. That's dangerous It's been a while since I've gone up against something this big 
Okay, well, what can we do? Eric is like, we need to get this over with quick. We're going to need weapons. Lots and lots of weapons. And that's how we end Something is Killing the Children, issue number three. Obviously, great issue, great tension building. Looking forward to this comic book, you know, being adapted to Netflix at the end of 2022. Not to mention, if you wish to add the slaughter pack of Something is Killing the Children, which is issues number one through five, the first story arc of this, link in description. It's a great comic book issue to add to your personal comic book collection. And not to mention, I personally believe this will go up in value once it airs on Netflix. And I believe it's going to turn out to be a fantastic show. Before we begin into this review, if you haven't done so already, like the video and subscribe to this channel to help Rated Comics to make more comic book related content and comic book reviews like this. We begin this issue with the first scene with Erica going shopping for weapons in the fourth installment of Something Is Killing the Children. She looks through the local home improvement store for a chainsaw and asks the shopkeeper for some peculiar items. It's kind of funny how she's like, I want the cheap one. He's trying to sell on the more, more expensive one. And it's just kind of funny going the back and forth with that. Arising is a little bit, maybe a harmless amount of concern. She specifically gets a cordless chainsaw while James is overjoyed when he discovers pruning shears and throws them in the car. Meanwhile, Tommy visits his father who seems to be struggling, laying on the couch, looking hungover, naked and drunk and sauced up. Tommy takes the opportunity of his unfazed father to steal his gun and return back to his car. At the same time, the sheriff chats with the coroner, who happens to be his brother, at the scene of the recent death. It's funny how they handle this differently. Tim, the coroner, uses black humor to cope, but it's obvious the dialogue that this is unlike anything that they've ever seen before. The victims have been terribly disfigured. There is blood everywhere, and there is a hole in the wall. I mean, literally, there's a hole in the wall. Not like the restaurant you go into. Despite this, there are no tracks, and nothing in the home is out of place, making the situation incredibly more difficult to decipher without solid evidence. A mysterious call interrupts the brothers amid the confusion. Refusing to reveal his identity, they let the sheriff know their friend in a seemingly condensing manner. Not to mention, he tells the other sheriff, the other deputy, that, hey, I know things about you, and it just freaks him out. You know about me, but I, but I can't know about you? Come on, bruh. Erica and James have an honest conversation about the monsters in this world. James begins by claiming they aren't real, but Erica knows that they are. Oh, and he's seen one too, especially after they killed his friends. He quickly declares that he does not believe in monsters being in some sort of denial. I mean, I would too, but then again, how can you explain all that? Erica responds with a description of the difference between knowing and believing. And it's worth noting that James and the other children can see monsters because they're young and their brains haven't evolved enough to forget about them. It's kind of like when you're a kid and you go sleep in that basement and you see that shadow and that shadow is just creepy to look at. That's kind of like the imagination where they're imagining these monsters. James is determined to assist her to do everything to stop this monster. She allows him to get near to where she believes the creature den is here, but demands that he stays outside the cave with the extra gear. Erica makes James promise to comply with to her rules to stay safe. Despite his stubborn pleads, at the same time, a few miles away, Eric is being watched by one of the sheriff's deputies. The sheriff phones in and strangely, he's instructed to not follow her wherever she goes. He just lets her do whatever she wants. He is unaware that the sheriff has just received a phone call from someone who knows something about Erica. The police officer prepares to pursue Erica regardless of the phone call. However, Tommy appears behind him, knocks him down as Erica enters the cave. She comes across a revelation we don't know yet ourselves. Upon entering the cave, she comes across a pile of dismembered bodies with Tommy right behind her. He accuses her of the murders, not knowing that the real monster is right above him. Oh, but that's cold. You accusing Erica of murdering your sister and this guy and this monster's right behind you, bro. Ooh, can't wait for the next issue. We begin this issue with the scene that James is sitting outside the cave wishing Erica allowed him to assist her. Perhaps gaining some sort of peace from trying to avenge his friends or maybe he just wanted to prove something. However, Erica was more responsible than that and she wasn't going to bring a youngster along on a monster hunt. James feels uncomfortable out in the freezing cold until his eye catches a disfigured body of a dead animal behind the bushes. Maybe a deer and he has a flashback of his friend's death from issue number one. To make matters even worse, the stuffed octopus begins speaking to him, ridiculing him, blaming him by saying it was your fault and pushing him to follow Erica. In this moment, it's obvious that he's making a big mistake, but he has made up his mind. 
Meanwhile, Tommy confronts Erica in the cave and demands for her to drop her weapon, not knowing the bigger problems that they're about to face. She has a chainsaw and he has a rifle. She also knows a creature is following him, but he is too old to notice because he can't see. The children can see. As Tommy gets closer with caution, she sprints past him with the chainsaw, drawing blood and attack that he doesn't understand. Blood is appearing out of thin air in his eyes. He once again accuses her of killing his sister and through gritted teeth fires at her, striking the monster instead. Quickly realizing how much more dangerous the situation has become, Erica tries to fight him off, but the gun fires again, this time striking James. She immediately reacts to the unfortunate occurrence and assures James of keeping him alive if he stays quiet. Tommy is undeniably panicking as Erica tries to silence him, fearing for their lives at the moment. Then, still alive, a little girl who seems of Asian descent approaches him. Erica is unaware of her existence after finding out her name is Bion. Tommy notices his younger sister Sophie's bot in the potty of disfigured body, which is terribly distressing and uh, one can only imagine what he must be going through. Erica requires his assistance and ejects him in the head with something that allows him to see the monsters. With the brief glimpse of a boardroom full of individuals wearing face masks with teeth on them, bright green eyes and cuddly animals that are not really so cuddly once you get to know them, it seems as if Erica belongs to this organization of people that look similar to her. After the injection, Tommy is left struck with disbelief after the horrifying revelation in front of him, which is the monster. Erica convinces Tommy to help James and Beyond escape the cave and to safety. The police, Tommy Knox, has just became conscious and the first thing he sees is Tommy and the kids. He drives him back to town as Erica, who is ready to kill, answers the phone with what seems like a spine-chilling discovery. The monster from this cave is not only the beginning, as she is the mother of many other monsters that have been set loose throughout the city, endangering many more people, many more children, and the citizens of this town. Like I said, this is the first story arc of Something's Killing the Children with the Slaughter Pack. Link in the description if you wish that if you wish to add that Slaughter Pack to your comic book collection, because when this show comes out on Netflix, I personally believe this is going to be an awesome show, and this will be an awesome comic book to add to your comic book collection. With that being said, Something's Killing the Children, issues number one through five of the Slaughter Pack. What do you guys think of the comic book review? Error is a comic book. Comment below, let me know. And also, if you like the content we're throwing up, you know what to do. Don't be shy and don't be stingy. Here are rated comics. We do awesome comic book reviews, comic book related content with the occasional comic book giveaway. Thanks again for watching. Until next time.